Morning, church. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, uh, please join me in 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to spend most of our time in that letter this morning. Uh, as we get started, I want to show you a picture of a ship. It was called the HMS Birkenhead. Um, you'll probably know that this looks much more like a drawing than a picture, and that's because it, it is. Um, this was one of the first iron-hold ships built for the United Kingdom's Royal Army. It was built in 1845, um, so this is before the time of pictures, and that's why you see this drawing instead. Uh, it was designed to be a warship, but just before it took off on its maiden voyage, it was converted to carry troops from one port to another. And so on one of those endeavors in January 1852, this ship set sail... Um, from Portsmouth, England, heading to South Africa. And along the way, it made several stops, picking up a lot of soldiers and even some of the wives and children's, children of those soldiers. And then on February 23rd, it docked briefly near Cape Town, South, South Africa. And the purpose for this stop was to disembark most of the women and children who were on board the ship because they were getting ready to enter some pretty dangerous waters as well as dangerous territory. Uh, two days later, the ship was, was curving just three miles off the South African coast, and it was doing that to, to stay out of the, the dangerous waters and to make a, as quick as a, an entrance into enemy territory as she could. During this trip, soundings were taken almost constantly. Um, and these soundings were to, to measure, of course, the depth of the sea. And these soundings were coming back that the sea was about 65 feet deep on average where they were sailing. It was calm and the night was absolutely, perfectly clear. Until, out of nowhere, the Birkenhead struck an uncharted rock sitting just a few feet before, but below the water's surface. My question to you today is, what do you do when catastrophe strikes? Where do you turn for advice? And in those moments, who do you expect to take the lead? We are on part three of a series that we are calling Beneath the Surface. And through this series, we're looking at the depths of church leadership. For the first two weeks, we looked at the biblical office of deacon, and we saw how the apostle Paul left a young evangelist named Titus on an island called Crete to, do you remember, kind of fix the problems in the church. And the thing was that Crete was a, a place with a bad reputation. It was a bunch of tall tale spewing bums who ate too much food. Do you guys remember that about them? Uh, they were lazy gluttons, known to be liars, and, and Titus' responsibility there was to straighten out the mess. Well, today we'll look closer at Timothy's situation. And to get going here, I want you to join me, 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Just to kind of give us an idea of exactly what Timothy was dealing with, this is what Paul says to him. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. In other words, this is Paul. And to Timothy, my true son in the faith, he begins by saying, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, Paul, this is me writing, and, and Timothy, I want you to receive this letter and hear what I have to say. This is how he gets going. Verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. In other words, Paul says, Timothy, you're dealing with a bunch of people who are very set on their traditions and customs that they've always grown up knowing. And when you get there, I want you to command them to stop. Imagine how well that's going to go, right? Here's these people. 
literally hell-bent on keeping up with their traditions. And now Timothy is told, I want you to go there and command them to knock it off, right? So already you can see that Timothy's set up in a very uncomfortable situation. This is what he says in verse 5. The goal of this command is love. And I want you to hear how weird that is, right? Timothy goes into a situation dealing with people so set on their customs and their genealogies and the myths that they've grown up believing. And he says, command them to stop. But the reason for the command is love. Hmm. And he says, this comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and they've turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Does this sound familiar from some things that we've looked at in the past couple months? Right? We talked about this guy named Jude. You remember Jude from a few weeks back? Right? Dealing with false teachers. And now we're looking at church leadership. And it seems that a lot of these things are interwoven within all the churches surrounding the Middle East as they're being planted. And it's crazy, right? And so there's all this turmoil with a lot of the same stuff going in and in, in, in all of these churches. And here's Timothy, a young minister, and he's taught to go in and command them to stop teaching wrong things, but do it from the, the motive of love. So Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus. And what I want you to realize is that this is a town with a church that is already up and running. Things are already moving. They already have programs going on, I would assume. And yet, even though they're already in motion, it, it, it shows that they're going the wrong way. And so there are certain people in that church who are teaching against God's truth. And Timothy's job is to command them to stop. Now, I want you in your Bibles to skip down to verse 18 of 1 Timothy. And this is what he says. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these, and so have shipwrecked their faith. And then Paul does something crazy. You notice in, in life, but specifically in church, we never want to mention names when it comes to problems. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you do. But look what Paul does next in verse 20. He says, among the problems, among them, are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Can you imagine, right? Paul, the great apostle, writes a letter to Timothy, who is at the church in Ephesus. And when Timothy receives this letter from Paul, what do you think he does with it, right? He immediately wants to read it, but not just for himself, but he wants to take it to church, and he wants to read it so that everybody hears the, the, the things that he shares there. And then he gets to this part, and he's talking about all the problems and all the, all the issues that they're dealing with, and then he throws out two names. Can you imagine those two guys sitting in church on Sunday morning hearing their name presented as the problems? Like, that just gets me all, like, flustered. I don't know what to do with that, right? And so these two guys who are the issues are called out by name and Timothy's told command them to stop what in the world do you do with that right look at chapter 2 verse 1 Paul says I urge you then Timothy first of all that requests prayers intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone what I want you to hear there is that Paul says, Timothy, you got problems. There are these two men in your church that are doing some horrible things. The very first step is what? Pray. Now, I know that sounds cliche. I know that sounds so Christianese, right? Like you got problems, you got to pray about it. But this is what Paul says. That if you're going to fix the issues within your group of people, your very first way to target that 
is through prayer. And then he says this, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, is this famous church leadership passage. Paul says, Timothy, you got to pray about it, and your next step is this. Here's a trustworthy saying, chapter 3, verse 1. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. In other words, Paul says, Timothy, you got problems? Your first step is to pray. Your second step is to appoint men to be leaders. But not just any men, specific men. When Rebecca and I got married, we immediately began dating like married people date. And you know what I mean. You get cleaned up on Friday night to go to the Walmarts, right? That's just what you do when you get married. It's exciting times. And on this specific time, we were being mentored by her parents, and that's what they did on Friday nights. So we got cleaned up, they got cleaned up, we met up, and then we went to the old Walmarts, right? And so had a rip-roaring good time, good stuff. And I remember one specific Friday night as we pulled into the parking lot of Walmart, uh, um, my father-in-law made the turn into one of the aisles to park his vehicle, and my mother-in-law from the back seat, she rolls down her window And like completely out of character, this is just really random, but she sticks her whole body out the back window and goes, hi Jan, just waving her, hi Jan, just excited to see Jan, which is a lady walking down the aisle of Walmart. And I remember looking at Jan and Jan is like, like looking over one shoulder and then the next, like a rabid dog is chasing her and then the issue arises and that is Jan is not Jan, right? And so point blank, as my mother-in-law is hanging out the back, hi, Jan, Come and, comes close contact with Jan, and, and it, it was horribly embarrassing. And so my, my mother-in-law just slumps down into her seat and slowly rolls the window back up, right? Mistaking someone's identity causes problems. And the problems that that causes are confusion, embarrassment, and frustration. And the church has often mistaken the identity of elders. And so to be as biblical as possible, we have to understand what an elder is and who who he is. The word elder is synonymous with other words like pastor, shepherd, bishop, and overseer. And you got a a spot there on your bulletin. The word elder is synonymous with these other words, pastor, shepherd, bishop, and overseer. And so if you see those words in scripture, they're all interchangeable. You see, our churches, our church and most Christian churches have a history connected to something that happened in the 1800s called the Restoration Movement. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Restoration Movement. The Restoration Movement had this one goal, and the goal was to restore the church as we see it today as closely as possible with the New Testament church that we see in our Bibles. And so one of the things that the Restoration Movement taught was to call Bible things by Bible names. Will you say that with me? Call Bible things by Bible names. Say it one more time. Call Bible things by Bible names. And so if we know what an elder is, then we should call an elder by Bible names. If we know what an elder isn't, then we shouldn't call him things that he's not. Pastor, shepherd, bishop, overseer, elder. All of those things are synonymous. And mistaking an elder's identity causes a lot of confusion, a lot of embarrassment, a lot of frustration. And so when Paul wrote Timothy about elders, he was wanting him to understand not to make a mistake about an elder's identity. And the way to do that is to make sure 
that the men appointed to be elders meet the biblical qualifications. If you hear anything today, if you remember anything today, if you leave this place with one idea, it is this. Make sure the men appointed to be elders meet the biblical qualifications. And so then Paul goes into some details. And there are five really quick things that I want you to see today that Paul says elders should not be. Okay? Five things. The first one is this. Elders should be men who are not addicted to wine. And this one shows up for elders just as it did for deacons. So there must be something about it. When someone in the Bible repeats themselves, there's a reason for it. And that is pay attention. Right? Paul wasn't just writing to the church in Crete known as gluttons or alcoholics, but he was also writing to the church in Ephesus where Timothy was located. And the arguments are the same, right? Why? Why not drink to excess, right? And some people will say, well, what what does Paul mean here by wine? What exactly is it? Is it beer? Is it strong liquor? Is it whiskey? Is it bourbon? The literal translation of this phrase, not addicted to wine, is... One who sits long beside his wine. One who sits long beside his wine. What in the world does that mean? I think it all boils down to this. If we value alcohol enough to defend our reasons for drinking it. If we value alcohol enough to defend our reasons for drinking it. Maybe. Just maybe. We're sitting beside it too long. And the fact that this subject is so touchy inside and outside of the church should probably tell us something. Elders should be men who are not addicted to wine. The second thing Paul says is elders should be men who are not violent. Not violent. Do you know anyone who has really sensitive buttons? Anybody have somebody in their life that has super sensitive buttons? Maybe some of you are afraid to raise your hand because... The person sitting next to you has really sensitive buttons, and you just don't want to throw them under the bus this morning. You know, they're the type of people who get mad at the drop of a hat, and and the word here about violent means someone who is a brawler. It's a person who is short-fused, ready to throw down at the drop of a hat as soon as their buttons are pushed. And Paul says, if you're going to appoint men to be leaders, to be elders, to be pastors, shepherds, overseers, bishops, right? Then you make sure that you're not appointing men who are brawlers, who have sensitive buttons. Because here's the situation. Elders are going to be placed in some very, very tight situations where they're going to have hard conversations. They're going to have difficult conflict. They're going to have uncomfortable discussions. And Paul says, don't appoint men who get hot under the collar when their feathers are ruffled. Uh, When I was in middle school, one of the games we played in P.E. was floor hockey. Anybody play floor hockey when you were in school, right? Yeah. You see, no rollerblades, no skates. It was just a bunch of middle school kids literally running around the gym floor swinging hockey sticks. What could go wrong, right? It seems, seems perfectly fine and safe to me. So um, there was one guy in my PE class who was offensively aggressive, okay? And uh, he was not an athlete. He was terrible at basketball. He was not a runner. He was not coordinated when it came to kicking a ball. And none of those things clicked with him. But floor hockey was his thing. And so when the PE coach said, today we're playing hockey, like the kid's eyes just lit up. And you could see, yeah, right? Just he couldn't wait. And so coach passed out the sticks, and everybody was like, oh, man, David's got a stick, right? Nobody, was, nobody wanted to see that because here's what happens. As soon as David got into the middle of the gym floor and the, puck, the, 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 the hockey puck was anywhere close to him, Kids scattered. I mean, just like as soon as the puck came near him, just kids just went to both sidewalls, just cleared out everybody. Get out of the way, right? And here's David. He takes his hockey stick and he rears it back like a golf club. Hands close, not separated. I don't know where he comes. Hands close, swings it back like a hockey 
a, a golf, golf club and just rears back and smacks that thing like it's his sole purpose to kill the puck. And the thing about that was that there was no control. There was no, no finesse. There was no way that he knew where that puck was going. It was just coming out hot. It was simply raw aggression. And Paul says the third thing when appointing elders... They should be men who are not, here's the word, quarrelsome. You see, people like this insist on on getting what they want. And when they don't get what they want, everyone around them knows about it. Paul says this refers to men who are offensively aggressive. Don't appoint them to be elders. There's another thing that he mentions this, in this passage from 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says, elders should be men who are not lovers of money. Not a lover of money. And this echoes what we heard about the office of deacon. The same thing applies here. How do you know if a guy loves money without seeing his checkbook? And the moral of the story is, is this next statement. If a man focuses more on possessions than people, if a man focuses more on possessions than people, he is not the leader the church needs. I want you to hear me very closely here. There is nothing sinful with making a lot of money. Okay, hear that. There is nothing sinful about making a lot of money. The danger lies when our focus and value are swallowed up in making a lot of money. And so Paul says, if this guy is more focused on possessions, he's more focused on money, if he's more focused on all of those things than he is people, he's got his priorities out of order. It doesn't mean this guy's going to hell in a handbasket or anything. It simply means he's not the leader the church needs. There's a fifth thing that he mentions in this passage. Elders should be men who are not quick-tempered. This specific idea comes from Titus chapter 1, verse 7. Here's what that verse says. Titus chapter 1, verse 7. Since an overseer... What is an overseer? An elder, a bishop, right? A pastor, a shepherd, all those things, same word. Since an overseer or an elder is entrusted with God's work, He must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. That one right there in the middle, not quick-tempered, does not appear to be a great way in our English language to communicate what Paul is trying to say here. Literally, that word, quick-tempered, it means prone to anger, Um. I brought a cannonball with me this morning. It's not mine, but uh, it's cool nonetheless. Cannonballs, or round shot, were first used in the 15th century. And their main purpose then was to destroy stone walls or castles that could not be penetrated any other way. And so they developed ways to shoot little stones, right, that they had smoothed out and had figured out how to fire at other stone. Now, because those were made of stone hitting other stone, they were faulty. But down through the years, they developed ways to make cannonballs, of course, out of cast iron. And not long after that, they developed something real cool called (laughs) gunpowder. Can I get an amen? Yeah, gunpowder is sweet stuff, isn't it? So anyway, they developed ways to fire these extremely aggressively at not just things made of stone, but eventually things also made of wood, and they would heat these things to red hot. They'd just be glowing, red, red hot, and they called them hot shots, right? And their purpose, because these don't explode, was to shoot a hot shot at something wooden, rather that be a building or a ship, and once that hot shot entered that vessel, it would then, of course, ignite something on fire, which would then in turn destroy the ship, right? And so these cannonballs became extremely dangerous. Now, since cannonballs never had the ability to blow up, we in the 21st century 
don't consider these very useful. We just throw them in our yards. This one came out of Kevin Blue's yard, to, as a matter of fact. Just laying, laying there in his yard because there's really no use for these anymore. But it was said back in the day that these were so fear-striking because they could literally blast through a column of 40 men. Think about that. Literally blast through a column of 40 men lined up back to back to back to back to back. Technological advances have made these obsolete. Today it makes very, very little sense to carry these puppies around. Because even as small as this is, it gets tiresome to hold it here. Yet it seems like many of us do carry these around. You see, grudges are like cannonballs. They're heavy and cumbersome. Keeping one of these handy proves to be quite unhandy. Carrying it around in your pants pocket would leave you pantless, right? It'd tug those puppies right on down there. And storing one of these on your shoulder would uh, it'd be, it'd be senseless. It'd be useless to do that. And so when Paul says that elders are not to be quick-tempered, he is not speaking of the short-fused, guns ablazing rage that you and I think of when we hear that word. Being quick-tempered actually speaks of deliberately nurtured and continually maintained anger. Think about that for a second. When you are nurturing and maintaining anger, it becomes pretty weighty, doesn't it? It becomes pretty burdensome. It becomes tiring and exhausting. And you and I, we call this a grudge. Paul says, don't appoint men who carry around cannonballs. Who carry around a grudge against someone else. Because grudges, just like cannonballs, can wreck a ship pretty quickly. Though the immediate collision with the rock caused some aboard the Birkenhead to die. Many of its passengers were still alive and well as the ship began to sink. And the reason the Birkenhead made history is because the people left on board, they reacted absolutely perfectly. History says that the soldiers assembled themselves together on the deck of the ship that was still remaining and simply awaited their officers' orders. The crew immediately placed the remaining women and children on the ship's main lifeboat. And then with the two left, the two lifeboats that they had left, they filled them to the brim with soldiers but came nowhere near fitting everybody left on board. And in the crew's own words, here's what happened next. It says, Lieutenant Colonel Seaton, guy's got an awesome last name. I think I'm related. Lieutenant Colonel Seaton took charge of military personnel and stressed the necessity of maintaining order and discipline. One soldier said almost everybody kept silent. Indeed, nothing was heard but the orders of Captain Salmond, all given in a clear, firm voice. The soldiers did not move. There was no panic even as the ship broke up only 20 minutes after first striking the rock. In a perfect world, danger would cease to exist. In a perfect world, relationships would never be strained. In a perfect world, there would never be conflict. In a perfect world, the church would be a place where smooth sailing always happens. But this is not a perfect world. Danger does exist. Relationships are strained. Conflict does happen. The church itself, it exists because it needs to. It has to in a fallen world. And because of that, there will always be moments of catastrophe. Times when things don't go as planned and those failed plans, they create consequences. It is in those times when clear, direct leadership is needed. That's why God, I think, gave the church elders. 
Men who will stand in the face of adversity, not to be managers, not to be bosses, and not even to be captains, but men to simply shepherd, providing gentle, clear leadership. You see, before Jesus died, he prayed. Imagine that. This is what he prayed. My prayer is not for them. He's talking about his disciples. It's not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. He says, Father, I pray just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. He continues praying. Father, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, Jesus prayed that, he, that we would be united so the rest of the world would recognize that there's something different about us. That instead of panic and worry, that we would be filled instead with peace and assurance. That in times of chaos and confusion, we would react with grace. So as we continue our way through the depths of church leadership, may Jesus' prayer be our prayer. May we be united so that our community understands there's something different about us than the rest of the world. There's something different about us because we love each other differently. There's something different about us because we recognize what good leadership looks like and we appoint men who follow suit. God, we love you and we thank you for the gentle, clear leadership that you've given us in your son, Jesus Christ. God, after he left, the church then had to figure out a way to continue following gentle clear leadership in the face of adversity. But you solved that even before we knew what was going on by saying, appoint elders, appoint men who have specific qualities and characteristics about them that show grace and mercy and love all mixed with truth. So God, may we be a church who constantly looks forward. And God, we know that Elders aren't the end all to everything. We know that they're still human. They're still fallen. They're still sinful. They still make mistakes. But maybe we be a people who call men up. Who call men up to healthy leadership. And may this church in the future continue to be a place that mentors men into being clear, gentle leaders. Who follow the example of Jesus Christ. God, we love you. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. May we in turn remain faithful to you. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with